Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Nicholson with the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation. And today I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Timothy Malleth with uh, Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. He's a radiation oncologist. And today he's here to talk to us about uh, radiation therapy for kidney cancer. So thank you very much, Dr. Malleth, for joining us today. Yeah, th thank you, Scott, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here to you know, share what we do. Um, Radiation therapy, as a lot of you probably know, is, is a really broad topic, and there's a lot of different components to it. And, you know, anytime we hear radiation, um, certain images come to mind, whether it be, you know, natural disasters or the Hulk or what whatnot. And so hopefully today I can show you what we do and kind of how radiation can be used pretty safely and effectively to treat cancer. So hopefully I can uh, today dispel some of those concerns and um, just kind of put you at ease if, if radiation becomes part of the treatment plan. Um, so as far as what are we going to cover today, um, I'm going to keep this talk relatively broad. You know, we can get lost in the weeds talking about the different data or the pros and the cons of treatment, uh, but oftentimes we just need to take a step back and say, why are we treating? What is the thousand foot overview or 10,000 foot overview of why we need radiation? And what is radiation? What will treatments be like? And then uh, I'll, I'll dive a little bit into, you know, how do we use radiation specifically for kidney cancer? Uh, radiation therapy isn't used as much for kidney cancer as what it used to be. Um, although it is making a comeback, and I'll explain all that as we go along, but I just wanted to, to briefly touch on um, uh, definitive treatments, SBRT. This is what we're starting to see more frequently now. This is curative, kind of in the place of surgery. We can give radiation either before surgery or after surgery, and we'll discuss those two scenarios, which are becoming kind of increasingly uncommon. And then we can use uh, radiation for pain relief, for symptom relief. We call that palliation. And that's uh, just in practice, that's anecdotally what we see the most. So before we dive into kind of radiation therapy specifically for kidney cancer, let's take a step back and talk about what is radiation therapy. Because radiation therapy is so radically different than surgery. It's so different than chemo, and it's, it's very different than, say, interventional radiology. Some of these ablative techniques, cryoablation, microwave ablation, those are all kind of different things. This is a very specific type of treatment, and I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like, uh, but we're basically using high-powered x-rays to kill the cancer cells. Um, and so how does radiation work? We use x-rays. Um, this is the same type of radiation that's used in, say, a chest x-ray or a CT scan, but several orders of magnitude higher. So it's like sitting under an x-ray for a very, very, very long time. Uh, but we can deliver it at much higher dose rates. We can uh, deliver it a lot more, I guess, precise than, say, a chest x-ray. And that's how we use it to kill cancer. It's all given externally. Um, so the treatments themselves, honestly, is just like getting a chest x-ray. And you'll hear me say that multiple times throughout this talk. Um, kind of getting a little bit more nitty gritty, the x-rays interact with the DNA and the tumor cell to cause DNA damage. So the x-rays come in, they kind of blast a hole in the DNA. The cells don't know what to do with that. And so the cells will eventually end up dying from that DNA damage from the x-rays. Chemo works in a very kind of similar way. X-rays tend to be a little bit more direct. Um, this process going from X-ray damage to cell death to death of the actual cancer can take anywhere from hours to weeks to sometimes even months to have a full effect. So if we're doing radiation for pain control, we don't expect radiation to have an effect, say, that evening it may take a week or two before you start noticing improvement in pain. Um, similarly, if we treat uh, a high dose of, of um, radiation therapy to 
uh, kill a small tumor cell or a small tumor on the kidney, that may take weeks, months, even sometimes years to completely like shrivel up and go away if it ever does. Because um, sometimes there can be some scarring. But the, the point of that being is that radiation is delayed. So we don't expect it to be like a chemotherapy or a medicine where you pop the pill and then you feel better within minutes. Radiation can take hours to weeks. And then the number one question I get asked in the clinic uh, every day, multiple times a day, the radiation we use, although it continues to work for weeks, uh, hours to days to weeks after treatment, you're not radioactive. You can go play with your grandkids or your kids. You can do whatever you want to do. You're not going to be radioactive. You're not going to turn into a hole. You're not going to give them any radiation. Um, and so that's, that's just something I want you to keep in mind is that with radiation, we really try to minimize your lifestyle disruptions. And so you can do everything that you're doing right now. All right, and so just kind of the process of what radiation planning looks like and how we go through the process. And this often, um, this often is, is confusing for people up front because there's so many different levels of safety checks and of, of planning that this whole process can take a week or so. And so first thing is uh, someone comes in, sit down, chat with us. We determine that radiation therapy is the way to go. The next step is to do what's called a CT simulation. And that is a separate additional CT scan uh, that allows us to design the radiation therapy off of. So we can be super safe, super accurate, because um, we, we design the radiation basically for each patient individually. So after this, we take those images and design the actual radiation plan. So we're designing specific for the patient, the type of disease, uh, so on and so forth. It's then planned and checked by master's level dosimetrists, PhD level physicists. Uh, and then it goes through basically some dry runs and safety checks. So by the time the treatment's delivered, we know that we're one, being effective, and two, we can deliver the radiation safely. This whole process from basically when you meet with us and get the CT scan to when the treatment starts is on the order of about a week. And so because we're so safe and we're so um, almost obsessive with trying to make sure that things are perfect, um, this, this takes about a week's time. And that's a little bit different than say chemo where you know, they write a prescription and you go and sit there and get the drug. With radiation, it does take time. And that is all uh, in the name of safety. So let's say the uh, radiation oncologist decides that the next step for you is to have radiation. The next step in that is to do what's called a CT simulation or a planning CT scan. And I'm sure you've all seen this, or at least have seen pictures. This is a typical CT scanner. Uh, this is one that's actually up in Mayo, Rochester that they use uh, to do the planning scans. This scan helps us be just as accurate and precise as we can be. We take these images and then draw out individually, say the kidney, the cancer, the stomach, the bowel, so we can be reasonably sure that we're avoiding what we want to avoid. In order to help us do that, we'll make these molds. And this is basically like a kind of a rigid bean bag. And we'll have patients lay here. You can see where the legs would go right here. And this just keeps you very still. This, it's not constricting, but it's just, it, it keeps you from really rotating your leg one way or rotating your belly the other. And so we'll do the, the planning process and then the treatment in this type of bean bag to make sure that that you're not moving. Just something to, to note, oftentimes we do use IV contrast just because it really helps us see the, the tumor and really helps us see what we're, what we're treating. And then some folks will actually, in some centers, may monitor your breathing. And what that looks like is a deck of cards that goes on your belly and it kind of goes up and down. 
the, the kidney moves a lot when we're, we're giving radiation. And so we wanna account for that motion. So there are some techniques that they may use. We call it deep inspiratory breath hold uh, or 4D CT. Um, there's a couple different cool sounding names out there for techniques that we use. Uh, but they're all just in the name of, of monitoring your breathing to, to make sure that as the, the kidney and the cancer move up and down, we're accounting for that. So we're not trying to shoot it here when the kidney is moving up here and we're not, we're not missing it. We're being able to move the beam kind of along with the, the motion of the tumor and be very accurate. So this is what that CT simulation and planning process looks like. And then the next step would be, like I said, the physicians and the physicists will take it over and design the radiation. And then we actually give treatment. And this is what the treatment machine looks like. And this is actually ours here in Mayo, Florida. Um, this is the treatment head. And this is where the radiation comes out of. And the rest of these just help us uh, make sure that you're lined up exactly the same each day. This machine, uh, and the reason this is blurry is this machine moves around. So you're up laying up on a table, you're laying as still as you can be, and then the machine moves around and delivers the radiation. And basically the only way that you know that, that the treatment is actually happening is that this machine will start to move around. We typically give radiation once per day, five days per week. Treatments can be anywhere from one single treatment, one day, to up to six weeks of treatment, 30 different treatments. So depending on the course that the physician just prescribes, you know, this could be a time commitment, 30 days, driving back and forth. Um, so I, I just wanted you to, to kind of be aware of that fact. With, with radiation, and especially here, we try to have folks door to door in about 30 minutes. So, um, so the actual treatments are very quick. We spend about 10 minutes in the waiting room, 10 minutes getting lined up just perfectly in that mold, and then about four or five minutes actually getting treated. So the actual process is very quick. We don't need to use sedation. We don't need to use, use anything like that. Um, so folks actually do very well from a day-to-day -day standpoint. So what does it feel to actually get the treatment? So let's say that's you or a family member laying on that table, the machine's going around. What does it feel like? Absolutely nothing. Um, the nice part about using x-rays is it feels just like getting a chest x-ray or a CT scan. And if you've ever had one of those before, you know that it doesn't feel like anything. You just stand in front, the light goes on, and then you're done. Same general idea with this type of radiation. Um, for most adults, we don't use anesthesia or sedation. Uh, that's more for kids. Um, so you're, you're able to drive yourself and, and a lot of folks still work even receiving radiation. So just a few terms to familiarize yourself um, with. Uh, one of them is gray, G-Y. This is a guy's name that we've used uh, as our units. And this is basically the dose of radiation that we get. So you'll hear us talk about 30 gray or 45 gray or 54 gray, uh, and that's just the dose. Fraction, that is a fancy term for number of treatments. So an example is that we give 30 gray in 10 fractions. That means we give 30 gray, which is this unit of radiation, which is delivered over 10 treatments. So this would be three gray per day for a total of 30 gray. Over 10 treatments, that is essentially two weeks of treatment given once per day, Monday through Friday. So this is uh, just something to keep in mind because we oftentimes forget that this isn't common parlance. And so we'll just say, oh yeah, we're gonna treat you to eight gray in one fraction. And, and gray is just the dose, it's kind of arbitrary, but the fraction is the number of treatments. Story and you're sticking yeah. So what side effects can you expect? And this is really kind of site dependent. Um, some folks will get it to the lung, which would be very different than in the kidney, which would be very different than in the brain. Um, but overall, radiation therapy is typically well tolerated. 
it's much better tolerated than what it was, say, in pictures that you've probably seen from 50 years ago. Uh, folks do well, at least in the abdomen and in the kidney. Um, some mild nausea, mild loose stools, those are typically the, the most common thing. Everybody that we treat tends to have mild fatigue. We're not sure if this is due to radiation itself or just the stress of having to come in and deal with us for multiple days and go through the process. But most people will have some degree of fatigue, not like with surgery, not like with the chemo, but you might just feel a little bit more tired than what you normally would. And then there are some possible long-term side effects, um, but these are all pretty uncommon. And we take great strides. And the reason this takes a week for us to plan is to try to avoid these long-term side effects. Uh, but there's always a risk that we damage, say the bowel or the liver or even the kidney. And so we're always weighing the risks and benefits. And as we talk about how we use radiation, it's important to know that we're kind of weighing the potential benefits against these long-term side effects. Um, these are all very uncommon, especially in today's day and age. Uh, but they have been known to occur and they're always something that we ourselves are keeping a very close eye on and really trying to prevent. So when do we treat uh, kidney cancers with radiation? Well, kidney cancer, um, as you all know, has evolved over the last couple of, of years and decades. Radiation isn't used terribly a whole lot anymore, although it is making a comeback. Um, Kidney cancers are typically treated with surgery and or medications, meaning immunotherapy, chemotherapy, now interventional radiology, which is a different specialty, uh, is doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, but it's typically treated either surgically or with chemo slash immunotherapy. Radiation therapy is typically only for lesions that can't be treated with surgery or are at particularly high risk. Um, and that is for people with uh, very high risk disease that would have a high risk of coming back, even if surgery were to remove 98 or 100% of it. And then, uh, at least among radiation oncologists, we felt that renal cell carcinoma has been resistant to radiation in the past. And so some work has been done that shows that this SBRT, this high dose and a low number of treatments has been more effective for kidney cancers than what we've been doing previously. And so this is because of this SBRT is making a resurgence and we're treating more and more kidney cancers with this. So SBRT, this is probably one of the most common ones that we actually use to treat the kidney and the kidney cancer itself. And this is a high, high dose of radiation therapy that is highly, focal, highly focused, and it's given over one to five treatments. So in the past, we've given kind of a small dose every day for up to six weeks. This is saying, you know what, that didn't work. Let's give it all we got in one to five treatments. And this tends to be both very safe and effective. And we use this oftentimes for small kidney cancers, for people who either don't want to go to surgery or aren't, wouldn't tolerate surgery very well. We can use this SBRT approach. So some folks have put together a guideline uh, of who should get SBRT for kidney cancers because, well, you could do surgery or you could do ablation with interventional radiology. There's a whole host of different techniques that we can use. And so this group of folks uh, came together and said, patients should get SBRT if one, they can't remove the tumor. If folks have a lot of other diseases that would make surgery really risky, SBRT may be a good approach. If it's really hard to reach with ablation or with uh, interventional radiology techniques, or if folks will be at high risk for dialysis or further kidney damage. We can spare kidneys a lot better than surgery and a lot better than some of the interventional radiology techniques. And so if folks are at risk of, of losing their poor, already poor kidney function, uh, we can potentially help 
spare some of that kidney function by giving radiation instead of surgery. And so folks have looked at it, folks have looked at some of the data. We are very effective at controlling early stage, tiny renal cell cancers with SBRT. Um, local control, meaning how likely are we to prevent the cancer from coming back in the area that the cancer was, is on the order of 93 to 98%. So we are over 90% effective at basically killing the tumor and you're just done with it. How about toxicity? Because we're always worried about side effects. It's pretty low, about one to 4% severe toxicity. So kind of as we're, we're looking at the scales of potential benefit and potential risk, with SBRT, we tend to move the scale to a high potential benefit and a relatively low risk, although we like to see this number as close to zero as we can. Um, as far as radiation and cancer treatments go, 4% is pretty good. Um, so SBRT is an option for folks who have kind of early stage small kidney cancers uh, that can't otherwise be treated with surgery or other approaches. So there's the preoperative approach, which is given before a planned surgery. So the SBRT is given in lieu of surgery. This is for a kidney cancer that is going to be removed from surgery, but is or by surgery, but is invading the nearby organs. If the tumor is starting to kind of eat up a blood vessel, kind of like Pac-Man, radiation can be used to come in kill the tumor, kill a bunch of it, hopefully get it away from the blood vessel so the surgeon can come in and remove all of the tumor. These tend to be longer courses. These tend to be on the order of 28 fractions, so almost six weeks. Um, and we're not entirely sure if these are effective. We have some studies that suggest that this is a great approach. We need to be doing this. Some studies say that patients didn't do all that well and that patients may have done worse. Um, each of these studies has their pros and cons and, and their caveats to them. Um, but the take home message is that the preoperative radiation therapy before surgery is typically not recommended. It's kind of on a case by case basis. If we see a patient where the, the tumor is really around a blood vessel or around something that, that the surgeon thinks if we could just get it a little bit smaller, we could take it out and the patient will do great. That's when we would use pre-op radiation, but it's not typically used for all comers like what it used to be. Same thing with post-operative radiation. This is, this is there's a tumor, uh, folks go to surgery, and then there's something high risk. They don't get all of the tumor, positive margins. There tends to be, or if there's lymph nodes there that were involved, if it invades some of the blood vessels, or if it's a certain kind of more aggressive type of cancer, these are all high risk features that you may need a little more of than just the surgery itself. And in that case, we would consider post-operative radiation therapy. Just like pre-operative radiation therapy, there's kind of a mixed benefit um, a lot of older studies looked at this, and so there's always that caveat that it may not apply to today's day and age, uh, but kind of taken together, the post-operative radiation helps improve our ability to keep the cancer from coming back in the kidney, but it doesn't do a whole lot in terms of overall benefit. It doesn't improve survival. It just helps the, the kidney cancer stay kind of dormant in the area that it's in. So kind of our last type of radiation that we use is something called palliative radiation therapy. And this is something that we see pretty much most commonly in our clinic. And this is radiation therapy, not to cure the cancer per se, but to really improve symptoms. If folks are having pain or difficulty urinating, for instance, if it's from the kidney, radiation could sometimes help. The most common thing we see is radiation therapy that has spread to the, or uh, excuse me, cancer that has spread to the bone. And this can be very, very painful. And radiation therapy is effective at helping improve that pain. So if kidney cancer spread to bone, someone comes in and says, you know, it's just, this is, this is very painful. Medicine isn't touching it. 
we're up to 80% effective in improving this pain. And these tend to be shorter treatments. We can do one treatment, five treatments, 10 treatments, kind of depending on the location, but we are 80% effective. And so this is something to ask your doctor if, if you do have cancer that's spread to the bone and normal pain medicine isn't helping, this is an area that radiation therapy has been shown to, to be pretty beneficial. And we can also do radiation for other sites. Brain metastases are something very commonly that we see. When the cancer spreads to the lung, we can also treat that. Or if the cancer spreads to the lymph nodes or somewhere else, um, this type of radiation is really on a case-by-case -case basis. And since our goal is to improve symptoms, we can really give a dose that can kill a lot of the cancer, maybe not all of it, but a lot of the cancer without giving a lot of side effects. So folks do very, very well through these treatments. And then an exciting area that I'm not really gonna to touch over because it's very controversial right now, but folks are starting to look at, well, what if they had a kidney cancer in one area of metastatic disease? Can we still cure those patients? And that's something called oligometastatic disease. If you hear that term, and that is something that is kind of an evolving story. And it's an exciting area to be in research in right now, because in the past, we've said if patients have metastatic disease, disease that's spread to the bone or the lung, that was it. It's stage four, uh, it's incurable. Well, now we're starting to think that that may be turned on its head a little bit. This, this field is very early on. Um, so I caution you to, to not take this idea and run with it, but this is, this is starting to be developed as an area that more physicians are interested in and more patients are really getting benefit from. So where, where do you learn more? Uh, the internet's a vast place and it can be a scary place. Um, so I caution you when you look up anything with a cancer diagnosis to stay kind of within, don't go too much out into the weeds on, on the internet. There's a lot of scary stories out there. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, these sites have been picked because they are accurate. They're done by groups of physicians. They're done by oncologists. And so this is a good place to start. The NCCN, they have great patient pages describing what radiation is like and describing the different treatment approaches. Same with the American Cancer Society. I, of course, have to put in a plug for our own website at, at Mayo. And then ASCO is a, a very large society comprised of basically anybody involved in cancer. Um, and this is, this is a great place to, to look up information. So th thank you again for having me and I'm open to, for questions. And questions we have, uh, Dr. Malif, I think uh, you had a very popular talk today. You got everybody asking questions in the chat. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. The first question that we have is from Nick. Uh, he asks, uh, is there any x-ray treatment for aorta window in the lung window? I'm not sure if that was a typo or not, <laughs> but did, did that make sense to you? So, so it, is the question about, is there any treatment for like say disease that's in the aorta or near the aorta or in the lung or? I'm gonna ask if Nick could please clarify uh, that question a little bit. Uh, Cause I, I'm, a, I'm a little yes, not okay. sure um, what he's asking. Oh, he yeah, said, so, he so said yes. I just saw in the chat that he clarified. So if, um, if that, this is really on a case by case basis but the short answer is yes if there is disease that is spread to the lung or kind of in the periaortic area and it's causing symptoms we can give a low dose of radiation to try to improve those symptoms um, but that's really honestly on a case by case basis and it kind of depends on on and with with the palliative versus curative it's it's really a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on what systemic therapy, what chemotherapies are available, how well a person's responded, how well their disease has responded to other, other um, therapies, 
how how close it is to the normal structures. It, it's kind of a yes, we can give radiation, but it's a lot more nuanced than that. And it's really a case by case basis on, on what exactly we can do. Thank you. And there there if we, if you do have questions that are specific about your type of treatment, we're going to be unable to answer those types of questions today because it is a more nuanced conversation on that. But um, it, we do have some more um, more questions from the group. Uh, Jan asks, um, experience with radiation for kidney cancer metastatic to the brain. Yes, we treat that a lot. Um, or at least relatively speaking. There are several different approaches to this. We can do something called SRS, stereotactic radiosurgery, which is a one time dose typically to, to the tumor. Um, here at Mayo, we have something called a gamma knife, which is a version of that. Um, and then there are some other techniques, but yes, we do have pretty good experience with treating kidney cancer and we can be 90% plus effective at treating kidney cancer in the brain. The fewer number of metastases to the brain, the better and the more effective we are. And then Glenn uh, says, I've, heard, I've often heard patients talk about a kill dose for radiation versus palliative. Can the doctor please explain this since it seems like all radiation is designed to kill cancer cells? That is a fantastic question. And this is, you know, we have courses on this. So uh, I hope, hope my answer is going to be kind of satisfactory. When we talk about palliative versus curative radiation, or what you're talking about, the kill dose, we can kill 100% of the cancer cells. We can kill, make sure they're gone, 100% chance of cure. But that comes at a big price. And so, so that can come with a lot of side effects. And so when we talk about curative, we are aiming to kill 100% of the cancer cells, but it may, it may come with a higher risk of side effects. When we talk about palliative, we're still looking to kill the cancer cells. It just may be 90, 95% of the cancer cells but we're willing to give up a little of that killing power to save folks from side effects. We don't want you to come up with skin reactions or terrible nausea or terrible diarrhea, for instance, um, in the palliative setting. So we can treat to a little bit lower dose, maybe kill 90% of the cancer cells instead of 100%, but have a much lower rate of side effects. That makes sense. Um, when you were talking about <clears throat> Uh, the scan process, and then there's a mold being made of the person uh, that uh, took a few people by surprise. They've had um, similar procedures recently, and they didn't get a mold of themselves made. Is that a new, is that a new thing that you're, you you guys are doing over at Mayo? There are there are so many different ways to keep patients still to mobilize patients. So the mold is what we use here. Um, but you know that's the Chevy version, and there's a Ford version out there, and a Toyota version, and there's there is a bunch of different types of immobilization devices that we can use, and so that mold is kind of what we use. Um, we make one each time that a patient gets treated, just because we want you in a different position each time. But there's there's different techniques out there, and so even though we use the mold, um, someone else might use something a little bit different. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what we're all comfortable with and, and kind of how we're trained. Um, <clears throat> Nicholas asks, any alternatives, uh, contrast types? So for me, with immunotherapy and GABO, the high salt is it does not have a good physiological response. And extreme sodium to one remaining kidney makes a bad day. Yeah, and so in that case, you know, the contrast isn't 100% needed. Um, we oftentimes use contrast with all things being equal, just because it helps us see better, and it helps our process go a little bit better. But if folks have kidney issues or are on therapies that don't count or have or therapies that may make it more difficult or have had a reaction in the past, it's no big deal not to get contrast. 
Um, and we have techniques and, and ways to kind of get around that that we can do kind of after the planning scan. Ella Waterman asks, uh, can we address proton versus photon radiation? <laughs> that is another fantastic question. And that, that is a two hour talk in and of itself. Um, so photon radiation is x-ray. And as you know, from getting like a chest x-ray, the x-ray goes through the body and out the other side. And so the amount of normal tissue that's getting radiation is kind of like an entrance wound, the actual tumor itself, and then the exit wound. With protons, there is no exit wound. It comes in, it hits the tumor, and then it just kind of peters off. There's no exit wound, so to speak. And so historically, um, there has been less radiation given with protons than with x-rays, with photons. This, photons have kind of caught up. And so for a lot of types of diseases, photons, the difference between photons and protons don't make any difference. Um, for some diseases, I would definitely recommend photons. For some diseases, I would definitely recommend protons. And it's really hard on this side of things to say, you know, which patient should get which, and it's still controversial. Um, there's a lot of, I guess, um, advertisements out there that protons have no side effects and protons have stopping power and they, you know, you'll get through with zero toxicity and they're much more precise than, than photons with x-rays. And that's just simply not true. Um, Photons and protons are two different tools that we have, and they each have their kind of appropriate use. And so that's just something I, I would ask, ask your doctor to sit down and say, hey, you know, are protons a good option for me? And oftentimes they'll say no, and oftentimes they'll say yes. And so that's, that's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. And, and that's something that I would definitely suggest bringing up in your consults. Um, but don't be alarmed if they say no, protons won't be any better because in probably 70%, and I'm just kind of throwing out that number of cases, they're no better. Thank you. And um, Nyla asks, what is lifetime, what is the lifetime radiation limit uh, from SBRT for a given area and for the whole body? So for the whole body, it's much lower. And we the nice part about radiation is the whole body does not get irradiated. So we don't even worry about the whole body dose. Um, that's just not something that, that we ever achieve. Typically with radiation, we can, there's no set limit. There's no, okay, you've received it once, we're done. It depends on the exact location. If, if we gave radiation to a specific, say, one centimeter area and a tumor grows in that area again, we might be more reluctant to give radiation than if it's just outside of that original area. Or if five years have passed since the previous radiation, we'd be more apt to give more radiation than if it came back within like a month or two. And so there's no set lifetime dose, but we typically get nervous if we treat beyond two times, for instance, to one area. If say something pops up in the, the leg and then something pops up in the lung, that's no problem. Thank you, doctor. Um, <clears throat> can radiation be used on a one centimeter round mass of renal cell carcinoma? Yes. Yes, it can, and that's a conversation to have. Typically, surgeons can remove those, but that's a, definitely a conversation to have. It is, you know, am I better for radiation or for surgery? Is proton radiation therapy more likely to have less damage to healthy cells? Uh, and she also says, thanks for everything. This is very helpful. Yeah, okay. glad you liked it. Um, so that's a kind of a complicated question to answer. So with x-ray therapy, 
proton therapy, we give the radiation, but it's spread out over say 360 degrees. So it's like you're shooting a whole bunch of different, different beams and they all kind of converge at the tumor. So all of the, the, the tissue kind of in that area, in that plane that we're treating, will receive a little bit of radiation. With protons, we use less number of beams. It's just one or two beams, they go in, the rest of the tissue outside of the two that we're targeting get zero radiation. So where does that make a clinical difference? We don't know. Um, in kids, that may make a difference, but in adults, we're not really seeing that there's a whole lot of difference between side effects for a lot of disease sites. And that's kind of really an evolving story because generally no radiation is better than some radiation, but there are some downsides to protons too. It's harder to get in for a proton consultation. Treatments take an hour, for instance, versus just a few minutes for us. And so there's a lot of other kind of factors weighing in on if protons or photons are better. And, you know, when it's all said and done, it probably doesn't make a difference in terms of the normal tissue getting rate radiation, whether it's protons or photons, or at least not to our current understanding. And a follow-up question, uh, which cancers would you recommend for protons? possibly the brain? Yeah, and just kind of speaking generally, if, if cancers are close to say the eye or the optic nerves there, uh, or at the base of skull, those are great candidates for protons. Um, certain rectal cancers or cancers in the pelvis are good for protons. Um, some people are treating with prostate cancer, although that's a little bit more controversial. Um, Breast irradiation after a mastectomy tends to, to be better with protons. Eye tumors tend to be better with protons. Um, but you know that's the current understanding now. And things are changing, it seems like, almost on a daily basis of what, how we should best use protons. And that's something on a national level that we're uh, debating about and arguing about and, and kind of exploring right now. Uh, and she, uh, one more question from her. She asks, who are the Mayo and Jax neurosurgeons doing SBRT for brain cancers? She'd like their name, address, email, and phone number. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, she, would like to, she would like to know if you know any um, uh, neurosurgeons that are using SBRT for brain cancers in town. So, yep. Yeah, so with the radiation oncologists typically are the ones who do the, the S SRS is what we call it in the brain uh, for brain cancers. And I, I just put in the chat the names of our, our two uh, brain doctors here in the, the department who, who you might want to reach out to. Um, kind of weird spelling, so I figured I'd just type it out rather than say it. Thank you for that. Uh, and have you seen EBRT radiation cause edema in foot and calf when treating lesions in the thigh? Yes, and especially so if there's been surgery in that area. So edema is caused by fluid that gets collected. So normally the body has lymphatics, the lymph chain. It's basically a highway that's that's bringing the fluid from say the legs back into the main circulation, the main part of the body. Radiation comes in and can cause some scarring. So it's basically like if we were to take a four lane highway and make it a two lane highway, you know, traffic's gonna get backed up. Same type of thing with fluid, same type of thing, especially in the foot and the calf when, when you really have to kind of push uphill to get that fluid back into the body. So yes, uh, unfortunately edema has been has been known to um, happen after radiation. Hmm. Uh, thank you so much, doctor. Um, the rest of the comments are thanking you for your time. And Nicholas had asked how he could get invited to um, some more webinars. And I'll, I'll share my screen real quick. Uh, if you go to our website at jnfkidneycancer.org, 
and you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see today's talk here, but then there's also a preview of our upcoming kidney cancer conversation next month, uh, talking about the treatment of small cancers with freezing and heat with Dr. Fumagalli, Paz Fumagalli. And uh, we're very excited for that one. You can register for that event on our, on our website and you can also follow us on social media. If you missed any, um, if on Facebook or Twitter, and if you missed any of this recording uh, we, or this presentation, the recording will be put on our website um, uh, by tomorrow and it will also be on our social media. And you can also find past kidney cancer conversations if you go to the education and support tab, it's under KC conversations. And so here you'll find a library of past conversations that we've had with other doctors, caregivers, clinicians, um, and you may find some helpful information there too. Um, Dr. Malif, I have one more question. Uh, it's, it's not really cancer related, so don't don't feel like you have to answer it, but you had mentioned earlier that these radiation therapies do not turn you into the Incredible Hulk. And I was wondering if you knew any that did. I wish <laughs> I did. Uh, that's an area of act my active research. So we'll, uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Hulk fan. So when you kept bringing that up, I kept thinking about it, but. Uh, I am too. I, I wish there was a way. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, guys. Well, this is the end for today. Um, please join us for upcoming kidney cancer conversations and the ones we got next time or previous ones. Thank you, Dr. Malif. And uh, I think everyone got something out of today. Thank you for inviting me. I really do appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.